the amateur radio club but here in the Monroe County. You guys are busy ones, aren't you? <laughs> well, that's great. I mean, it's, it's great to, to serve your community, and that's exactly what, what you guys do for the National Weather Service. And, and for those of you folks who are, are not part of amateur radio, if you ever thought about the idea of perhaps joining the club, um, they're always looking for new members. We're always looking for the younger ones because a lot of the older ones will eventually move on and, and, and we need replacements down to the bottom and, and that you serve a great purpose for, for your community with the information that you can provide. From our standpoint, the National Weather Service, that's provision of information regarding the storms and that's, and that's what our program tonight is about. And it's about storm spotting and we're going to cover cloud structures that are associated with severe weather. We're going to cover radar signatures that are associated with severe weather. I'm going to show you how you can tie those two pieces of information together so that when you're looking at the radar, you can almost expect what to see in the sky and, and, and or the, uh, the opposite side. If you see something out in the sky, you can probably anticipate what the radar should look like in association with that. So uh, this runs on the order of about two hours long, give or take how fast I talk and how um, brief I am or, or how many questions are asked, but uh, we'll take a break about an hour into the program give you a chance to stretch your legs. Um, there will likely be clipboards passed around the room here. If you didn't get a chance to sign back at the desk, uh, try to do so before you head out of here today. Um, so the topics that we cover here are the same that I have covered each and every year I've been here. I think this is my, and this is not what I wanted to do, this is my 16th year of, of coverage here in central Indiana for storm spotter uh, presentations. and. Uh, and as we say each and every year, spotters have played an important role in the warning process. Um, I'm also going to briefly cover the events of 2009. I say briefly because there weren't a lot of events that took place last year. Uh, but I do want to talk and this talk the same thing that I talk year in, year out. The types of storms that causes our problems. The squall lines, the supercells, both of which can produce tornadoes. They also are both capable of producing flash floods. All storms contain lightning, so we're going to cover those various aspects. The type of information that we look to have reported to us so that you can help us out in the process. And we'll finish up with a little bit of an interaction of, again, comparing radar to, to cloud um, and what you should anticipate based on what you're seeing on radar or what you're seeing in the sky. As the slide says, we need you. We can't do it without you, in fact. I mean, we've got great tools at our, our weather office that we utilize on a daily basis, but they don't carry the entire picture. Um, our job, our mission, is protection of life and property through the issuance of timely and accurate warnings. Um, but again, we need your help with that. Your local eyes on the sky with regard to what's taking place here, that combined with the technology and, and our tools that we use, we hope in the end that we're saving lives. And that's what this is all about. Why do we need you? Well, our radar has limitations. The radar beam by the physics that, that guide it, that beam gains altitude with distance, and that beam also broadens with distance. And so when it broadens, uh, that means the resolution gets coarser and coarser the farther away you get from the radar. Uh, that raising with height as you gain distance from the radar, by the time it gets down to here, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, because I never really pay attention, but the beam's probably somewhere in the water about maybe it's close to 5,000 feet above ground level, give or take 1,000 feet either side. But the importance of that is, or what that means is that when we're looking at radar, and when you're looking at radar, what you're looking at is what's taking place well above the ground. And that doesn't tell us the whole story. We don't know what's taking place down here at ground level, and that's what you, the spotter, is all about reports that you provide to us that we in turn pass along to the, the local media, in radio and television, they in turn pass that information along to the general public. And so when you report to us that there's been some baseball sized hail here in Bloomington, well folks downstream where that storm is headed to know that storm means business and that increases the likelihood that they're going to take safe action as a result of the report that you provided to us. Most folks don't pay a lot of attention to the warnings we issue, quite frankly, especially severe thunderstorm warnings, until it's hitting the fan outside. And really the same holds true with regard to the tornado warnings we issue. Yeah, their ears will perk up if they hear that their town's in the path of this tornado. Yeah, they're going to pay closer attention, but we found through experience that, that typically most folks will not take action until, again, it's actually hitting outside. And, you know, and I can kind of understand that. You know, you've got a busy life. Everybody's got a busy life. And, 
and why do something you don't have to do if you don't have to do it. But sometimes Mother Nature forces you to do things that you don't want to do. So these are the important reasons why your information and our warnings can make a difference. Now, as I mentioned, 2009, there wasn't a lot that happened, but like in the previous couple years, things started early. In 2008, they started in January. In 2009, we started in February. So it tells you that storms, severe in nature, with tornadoes, can happen any time of the year, any time of the day or night, given the right conditions. In this case here, this is a squall line that moved through the entire portion of central Indiana, produced a small tornado up near Muncie. It was an EF1, enhanced Ujita scale number one intensity. The winds were about 100 miles an hour with that particular storm. One a little bit closer to home, not too far away from here, in March of 09, down near Bedford, we had a couple of tornadoes take place, one pretty significant, the other a little bit smaller. This is the, the radar picture from that time frame, and this is the data that you're normally used to looking at. We call it reflectivity data. It's a measure of the amount of, of reflected energy from the raindrops back to the radar, and, and we paint greens to be light precipitation and reds to be intense precipitation. What you may not have used very much is, is this data here, the Doppler velocity data. It's an important tool that can provide you a measure of the estimate of the strength of the winds in that storm or the strength of the rotation within that storm. This storm had rotation. It produced two tornadoes, an EF3 on the west side of Bedford near Fayetteville, which in fact damaged, in fact completely destroyed a couple of homes. And this was some of the damage that was up on the north side of Bedford. That was an EF1 tornado that occurred up there. We move on a little bit in time, and again, there wasn't a whole lot that happened last year. Uh, Memorial weekend up around Indianapolis, we had this cluster of storms move across the area, produce a little bit of severe weather, nothing real substantial. Um, you can see a couple pictures that were provided by some of the storm spotters sent it into our office, and here we've tied it up with the radar. Uh, just a few days after that, a more significant event occurred in the Indianapolis area, especially up on the northeast side near Fishers. The hail that you see on the right-hand side is some of the hail that, that was pounding houses, including my own, up in the Fishers area. I had uh, quarter-sized hail and 60-mile-an-hour winds at my house. I was fortunate not to have 60-mile-an-hour winds with the golf ball to baseball size hail, or I would have had some real, real serious damage, like some homes and businesses did in the Fishers area. And then we finished out the year last year. It was in the month of August, and it was out in western parts of Morgan County, southwest of Indianapolis. And uh, you see this little tornado right here that was coming into the small town of Eminence. And what was taking place in this tornado here is you had this one line right here that's south of Indianapolis and it was moving southbound. And it was clashing or colliding with this southeastbound squall line that was coming from western Indiana. And the collision point between the two is an area in which rotation developed and produced this little tornado. And EF1 went right about 100 miles an hour did about a block's worth of damage in this little town. In total, we saw 11 tornadoes across Indiana last year. Our long-term average is around 20. As a low year is somewhere around 10 or less, so we were a low year last year. A high year might be in the 30s or 40s. Our extreme year, and I don't remember the exact number offhand, I think we were in the 50s for tornado counts, and that was back in 1990. So it's been a while since we've had a significant number of tornadoes, so we're, we're long overdue, uh, and so we need to be prepared.